Hello and welcome to History Hack. Today it is another hedge hopping outing and today we're slightly stretching the Second World War rules for the show because today we're going to be going to Korea. The Korean War is very much the epilogue to the Second World War that nobody wanted. While our collective minds always go to sabres and migs slicing through the air at Mach 1, much of the war was fought with equipment and technology that the men had, in many cases, fought in before. Today, we are joined by pilot and author Michael Napier, whose stunning new book, Korean Air War, looks at the conflict and the air over the peninsula and how the lessons learned from the previous war were tested yet again in what was thought to be the last hurrah of the dogfighter. Mike, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Yeah, very well. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> so how's lockdown been for you? That's where we usually start these things because it's, you know, hopefully coming to an end. Well, luckily, I, I stopped working before before the... the um before the, it all kicked off so I haven't had to worry about work which has been quite nice and uh, I feel quite smug about that but um, uh, the, the novelty of being stuck at home all day every day is beginning to wear off now I've, I've had lots of stuff to do I've had various sort of research and writing projects it's been great to have that and great to have you know no excuse for, for, for you know, not doing it but um, equally well I've got to the stage now where I just want to go down the pub and have a chat with my mates and that's why I'm, I'm ridiculously excited at the prospect of talking to you about Korea because my, my wife and daughter don't want to do it. <laughs> oh the pub. Yes, we, indeed, we yeah. walk past our local and stroke the door every once in a while so oh, we'll, we'll see you soon. <laughs> yeah <laughs> miss you. <laughs> <laughs> so Korea what made you think to, to, to go to Korea because it is very much still the, the forgotten war in many many aspects. It is, well, it's the completely forgotten war, and, and which is a shame because it's actually the 70th anniversary, well, last year was the 70th anniversary of it starting, but, uh, you know, at the moment we're, we're 70 years on from the, the, you know, the big battles and stuff that, that went on there. But, yeah, I a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, five years ago probably, I had started doing some research into just general RAF um, operations and things, and I'd heard about the Korean War, and I thought, what happened there? I, know, I knew that the RAF was not hugely involved. I knew they had flying boats there, but that's about it. So imagine my surprise when I discovered that there were about 70 pilots had flown operational tours and things with the American services and uh, with the Australian Air Force as well. Um, so I started delving into that. And as I did it, I thought, well, I need to, I really need to uh, read about this and get, get this into perspective. And uh, as I looked around, I found that I could get books on um, one single aspect, what the USAF did, what the Navy did, um, what the Marines did and all that. But uh, every one of those was very one-sided and and quite biased as well really so um clearly what needed to be done was uh, was a book needed to be written about the whole thing so yeah if you want a job done do it yourself so that's what i did basically <laughs> um and, and it's been it's been fantastic and and you know almost every time you 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 turn the corner you you see something else and go wow that's that's amazing as well yeah i i, I completely agree with you there there's there's lots of good books about aspects um and very, very few that sort of try to look at it in that sort of complete campaign, which I think your, you know, your book does. I've, I've been, I've been going through it, and the imagery, which is great to talk about for a podcast because we can't show anybody. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. we the, can make everything up, can we? <laughs> the pictures are great. Everybody, take our word for it. Go yeah, the honest, they are really good. <laughs> but we're gonna, we're gonna get into some of the meat because yes, that RAF involvement. It's, it's my, my mission in life to have a, a typhoon link into every every one of these podcasts oh, yeah. and of course johnny, johnny Bowen, Bowen, yeah. yes typhoon ace extraordinaire was was out there and of course he's still officially missing in action yeah he met his sticky end there um which was a great yeah a, a great shock and a great shame i think um because he was a very very well respected fighter leader it seems it was it was just you know disorientation and controlled flight into terrain which after 200 and something sorties in typhoons and then is it nine in Sabres to have that happen? Seems a bit of an anticlimax. Yeah, it does. And I, shows, I guess it shows how, um, how different jet aircraft were in many respects to, to their piston engine aircraft. I think it shows also the, dare I say, the difficulty of, of weather, particularly in Korea, um, Korea in the summer, because the, you know, there are massive storms out there, massive problems with clouds and God knows what else. You know, all the, the, the G-forces and, and acceleration, et cetera, in a, in, a, in a jet fighter. I think he was actually on somebody's wing at the time, but one can only assume that he got disorientation. I guess once you, once you lose touch with you know, information, you've got to break out, and, uh, and, and that's, that's where, where, where he lost control, we think. 
Mm. But uh, no, nobody knows. <laughs> yes, we're, we're not going to waste any time on the silly conspiracy theories. No, let's not do that. Yes, but anyways, <laughs> although I think I think uh, I think some Russians or, or perhaps the Chinese might have, might claim that you know it was them, but um, I think it happened somewhere miles away from anywhere that they were operating anyway. So. Yeah, I, I think when it got out, he he was you know a, as a name, everybody wanted to to claim it. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, uh, James, if you're listening, hello, that's Johnny's son. Oh, okay, well, yes, yes, indeed, yes. yeah. Right, that's there we go. That's that's my my two typhoon link. We'll come back to see Fury oh. later, which I can get another one in. Let's sort of describe the air forces here. So, Mike, who who was involved? Who were the main players in this? Uh, well, there's lots actually. So we've got the two careers, and um, I say a large number of air forces, each of which is is actually quite fascinating in a, in a different uh, way and for different reasons. So let's start with North Korea. So North Korea being good communist chaps. Um, at the end of 1945, when uh, when they got installed in, in North Korea, started making preparations to to you know, take over the whole of Korea. Um, so they, they made sure they had a well-equipped army, and they thought, oh, we'll have an air force too. So they started um, creating an air force. Um, so by the time 1950 comes along, it's been going for about five years. Um, they've got various guys who, who had flown with the Japanese Air Force, so some, some quite experienced people. The Russians have given them some nice airplanes, um, they've got some Milushin IL-10 Sturmovik, so these are the sort of um, anti-tank um, aircraft that float across the battlefield and take out um, main battle tanks, and have been very successful in, in doing that on the Eastern Front, with, you know, flown by the Russians. Um, and they've got the Yak-9 um, sort of spit, Spitfire ski, one might say. Um, they've got, it's not a massive air force, they've got a regiment of each of those, uh, so a regiment should be, what, say, about 30 to 40 aeroplanes, um, so that's roughly what they've got, but they don't have that many pilots because they're still um, they're still training. So when the war kicks off, from the Air Force point of view, the Korean Air Force is is quite immature, really. It's um, it's got these aeroplanes, but they're quite short range aeroplanes. It's got pilots, but it hasn't got many pilots, so it's, it's limited in, in in what it can do. Then we've got the South Korea. Now the South Koreans also decided that they own North Korea and they go and invade it one day. But the Americans sort of got wind of this and said, oh, no, you don't. With the result of that, they were not a very well-equipped Air Force. In fact, they had hardly anything at all. They had just a, a handful of light aircraft, um, artillery spotters, that kind of stuff. And they had about five or six T-60s. That's what you and I would call a Harvard or American would call a Texan. Um, and that's all they had. Um, oddly enough, uh, I think Congress had vetoed the supply of um, F-51 Mustangs to the um, South Koreans about um, you know, two weeks before the war kicked off. But there we go. Such is life. So there's two careers. We've got the, uh, the USAF, the United States Air Force, which is only two years old. No, you say it was in the Second World War. No, I say it wasn't. That was the US Army Air Force. And that little A in the middle of it all is actually really important because all the guys who are running the US Air Force were ex-army officers, although obviously they're, bit, they're specialists in air power, and all the army generals, etc., in across the states and in um, in, in, in that um, theatre, were all adamant that it's uh, ridiculous that the Air Force should be a, 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 it's a, an independent service and actually it should be part of the army and we'll make sure it is again. And so there's this massive political debate going on of the army trying to do everything they can to make the USAF look useless. And the USAF generals running around in circles, trying not to, not not using um, air power objectively, but just de desperately trying to sort of um, fight off the army and, and do things. So they appeared to be, you know, oh look, we are doing things. Um, okay, <laughs> what you're doing is utterly useless, but there we go. Actually, that's unfair, and we'll come back to that later. But but they the USAF really had its its hands tied behind its back, really, for for, for much of, of of the war in terms of using air power properly one might say. Um, then there's the Russians. Um, and at the beginning of the war, the Russians aren't really around. They've, they've got, um, they own um, Port Arthur, now, now known as Dalian. That's um, hired out to them by the, um, by the Chinese. And they've got a, a, an air um, corps there. Um, I think three divisions of aircraft. They're, they're, they're all propeller aircraft. Um, they're probably not very well maintained. You know, it's a bit of a backwater. Um, so th that's the nearest thing to Korea. However, there is, I think it's the 29th Guards Reg um, Regiment, I can't remember the exact number, but they are over in uh, Shanghai, where they are A, helping the um, Communist Chinese against um, air, air raids coming in from, from Taiwan, but also they are training the new 
Chinese Air Force. And that brings us on to probably the most interesting bit of the lot, which is the Chinese Air Force, because the Chinese Air Force was founded in 1949. So when the war kicks off in the middle of 1950, it's only <clears throat> perhaps nine months old. Um, now, whereas everybody else had started an Air Force be by having an Army Air Force, the Chinese start from zilch, nothing. They have nothing. They have no airplanes. They have no pilots. So they go in 1949 from absolutely nothing in a large or massive, largely um, peasant um, population to a large combat proven air force three years later flying jet fighters so i mean whatever one thinks of their success rate or anything else they, the, the chinese air force is and they see it as very much as their <clears throat> their great successor born in battle their, their victory against the um the yankee um you know hordes etc <clears throat> and i think in, in many ways that you know the, 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 it's quite right that they should be seen that way that they you know that to, to to build this air force from absolutely nothing in the space of you know three years is, is phenomenal i mean really is it is fantastic they've done that so, there's, so the chinese are there in the background slowly you know from nothing as the war kicks off to to um you know building quite a large presence by 1953 um because it, it should oh, should be shown that chiang kai Chek got all the aircraft didn't he yeah yeah <laughs> that's right yes. <laughs> yeah that's right and then he bombed chiang kai with it <laughs> which is why the russians came in <clears throat> it all goes around in circles doesn't it yeah <laughs> um yeah so then we thought um the uh, royal australian air force so what on earth are they doing there well they're what at the end of uh, the world war ii um he says we're moving in because you said we're it's all part of world war ii um, still uh, lingering on uh, there was the air force of occupation and the uh, commonwealth uh, british commonwealth um, air or a wing or whatever it was or group or formation and uh, that included uh, number 77 squadron of the royal australian air force and when everybody else went home 77 squadron obviously got forgotten about and they, they were left in japan uh, so they there's this uh, squadron of meteor uh, meteors a squadron of, uh, of mustangs um, in Japan, and they're fully integrated into the uh, US um, uh, Air Force, um, out there, the Fifth Air Force, but obviously they, re they remain under, uh, uh, under um, Australian government control, and they are regarded very, very highly. They are um, a ground attack squadron. They are regarded as being a very, very professional outfit and, um, and are very well respected. Then we've got the um, the RAF, and of course, when the war kicked off, um, the great allies, uh, you know, Americans said, right, we need our allies, and the British turned around and said, well, we'd love to help you next week, but we can't, because actually we're quite busy in um, Malaya and in Kenya and in everywhere else, where they, everywhere else where all the locals have said, well, thanks very much for the British Empire, we're leaving. Um, and we're saying, no, you can't. Um, and also in Germany as well, where uh, you know, the Second Tactical Air Force uh, is, is, is taking a, a lot of, um, of manpower. Uh, you know, again, in, in the big picture, everything is, uh, it, it, it is um, shrinking massively after World War II. So, so the, Air Force, the RAF is dwindling. And in fact, all they've got are the flying boats, all they, you know, the, the flying boats in the Far East flying boat wing based uh, around Singapore that, uh, and Hong Kong. And so they send a few of those around as a sort of token. You know, this this should help you, chaps. Um, but the, as, as I mentioned earlier on, the, the, there's an awful lot more um, Air Force RAF uh, involvement uh, then comes in. One of the first things that happens is the um, once the world war kicks off, is the Americans realise that very quickly, um, at, well, say the North Koreans realise very quickly, should I say that um, if they move around by daytime. Um, the American bombers can find them and um, and bomb them. So they very clearly think, well, we should move at night time then, as you do. And the but the Americans, despite the fact that about ninety percent of uh, of North Korean stuff was being you know, supplies and, and equipment and people were being moved at night, was only flying about ten percent of its sorties at night. Um, and they were not being terribly successful. Um, the B-26s, which were what was being used, the B-26 Invader, not, not the B-26 Marauder of World War II thing, um, they were all actually really um, badly maintained and um, sort of left that very much leftover sort of relics and um, <laughs> much probably could be said about the crews. No, that's probably very unfair. But um, yeah, the, the whole thing was, it was completely uncoordinated. It wasn't very good. So they thought, wow, who do we see about this? And, uh, and again, it's, I think hats off to the Americans because they, they they're very keen, rather than thinking, well, we'll 
we'll invent it ourselves to, to look around the world and go, well, where, where's, where can we get the best practice? And, and let's have a look at that and then modify it. And they did that. And they said, oh, well, the Brits, they, they did quite a lot of night, night stuff during the World War II. Let's get them. So Peter Wyken Barnes, who was a uh, very, well, a, a, a very respected um, fighter race, but also a, a night intruder pilot, was invited to go across. And so he arrived and uh, gave a lot of advice uh, on how to run night intruder operations. At the same time, Johnny Johnson, who's the, the highest scoring British um, fighter pilot of World War II, uh, was invited, invited across really as an observer to, to have a look so that he could then report back to the RAF to, to see if there are any lessons to learn. But again, he, you know, his, um, he, he had to go pretty much everything and, uh, and wrote reports about it. And, and, and the Americans also were very keen to read that as well. So, so there's this sort of advisor side of things. And, and um, uh, certainly um, working Barnes when he went was replaced by uh, um, a, another um, night intruder pilot whose name briefly escapes me. So, so there, was, there was a sequence of RAF um, advisors there. Then there were exchange officers. So guys who were RAF officers on exchange postings to, to USAF units were rolled into this as well. So um, a guy called Alan Boxer, who's uh, with one of the B-29 units. He's an experienced bomber pilot from, from World War II. In fact, he also got, was involved in, in dropping um, agents, but with the SOE agents as well. So he did quite a lot of interesting stuff. And so when his wing is, is detailed to, to move from, I think it was Washington State, back across to, uh, to, to uh, the North Pacific, He's the guy who is given the job to sort it all out. And when they get there, he's one of the guys who, who leads some of the missions. So, you know, there, there were some quite high profile um, uh, characters in, involved in all this. And then guys who were on exchange flying the F-84, fl flying um, ground attack missions, a um, couple of those, a uh, couple of guys flying F-86s as well, all rolled in to, to fly their combat tours that, that every pilot in the USAF was, you know, kind of expected to, 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 to do. So, so Brits pulled their weight there. There were also, and we mentioned uh, Johnny Baldwin earlier on, the reason that Johnny Baldwin was out there was that um, the Central Fighter Establishment was also um, invited by the Americans to go across and, and do, you know, four, four guys at the time, do a tour, a combat tour, so then you can go back and you can teach, you know, what's actually happening you know, in modern jet fighter tactics. So there were four of these groups, so 16 guys all in all, sort of uh, in, in, in groups uh, that followed each other. Uh, Johnny Baldwin led the first one, um, and they, again, were integrated into the, the process. He becomes one of the sort of executive officers in his, in his wing. So very well respected by, by the Americans um, and, and flies his commercial fortune, as you mentioned, um, and meets his end there. So, yes, for, for, for the, those that want to know, it was the 50, 51st fighter interceptor wing. As yeah, I, yeah. My, my Johnny Baldwin notes. A <laughs> good man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I'm utterly useless at remembering all these things. <laughs> oh, I, well, the, the problem is, of course, diver, diver, is, is, is you write a book and then a year later it gets published and people ask you about it, but, but then you've had a year doing something else. <laughs> That's a pathetic excuse, we'll, isn't it? We'll, we'll let you off, Mike. You're, yeah, you're, doing, you're uh, doing well so far. So far, so I'm making up well as I say. Yeah, and then, then what happened was, the um well two things but firstly um the uh, RAF thought it'd be a jolly good idea if more of their pilots um flew with the americans so it was negotiated that i think about 15 or 20 um, pilots uh, brackets who had to be volunteers but no really who, who were uh, were selected to go across and uh, to fly the f-86 i think a similar number to go and fly the f-84 and also at the same time the australians were were flying their their meteors and um had lost quite a few guys and australia isn't a massive place with a, with a massive number of pilots so they're they running a bit short so um they asked or were, were offered raf pilots to to join 77 squadron so at any stage there were between four and ten brit pilots flying uh, for 77 squadron flying meteors for 77 squadron as well so again all, all this added together comes up to the numbers are around about 70 guys who who, who, who went out there and, and flew to us and so so that's the RAF uh, as I'm dribbling on um, the Navy um, Royal Navy was involved uh, there was usually one aircraft carrier at a time uh, would, would be on station of course the US Navy I've managed to completely miss them out but uh, there there was a massive um, place as well and again the interesting thing for them was that they had spent the US Navy had had, had perfected the art of um you know the, the sort of island hopping amphibious assaults aircraft carrier versus battleships you know the the, the, you know, the task force went across and took names kicked ass all across pacific arrived at korea and suddenly there's the <clears throat> well 
you're not going anywhere. So from, from running its own independent operation, it's suddenly trying to integrate with the USAF, which doesn't really want it there anyway, but it has to be. And the massive problems of, you know, one headquarters in Japan, another one in Korea, and then somebody else on board a ship, trying to tie all that together um, causes massive problems. And also, um, the again, I'm sorry, I'm jumping forward here, but the forward air controlling um, that, that, was all, that, that was organized by, so the USAF had, had had got this scheme whereby um, a forward air controller would jump in a, in a T6 um, and that, known out there as a mosquito. So that your mosquito would fly around and would um, spot targets just sort of beyond the, um, where, where, where the action was happening. And fighters would, would be coming in at sort of, um, you know, five, 10 minute intervals, a pair of fighters would pitch up and, uh, they, and the, the guy would say, right, so it's over there on that hill, go and attack the you know, trench, tank, troops, D or the above um, that are there. <clears throat> So that, and that worked pretty well um, because you, you'd send two guys off from Japan and then 10 minutes later, another two guys take off and, and so it went on. Um, however, one aircraft carrier in the days before they had angled decks, you could either A, launch aircraft or B, recover aircraft. <laughs> you couldn't do both. So, so the uh, US Navy would fire off 40 airplanes, which all cut off, and they'd suddenly arrive and the FAC and his mosquito would be there. And uh, instead of having two airplanes pitching up every five minutes, he ended up with 40 pitching up at once. <laughs> and, uh, so, oh my goodness me. Not only that, but the, um, the American Navy and Marines had a different idea of what close air support was. So instead of an airplane flying remotely above it and finding targets sort of 100 yards away from the troops, um, they had a bloke in the front line with a radio calling airplanes in to 20 yards in front of the troops because that's what you had to do if you were invading an island that's got lots of Japanese people on it. So that's what, so there's this complete mismatch between what the USAF, how the USAF operated and, and what it expected and what it did. And on the other hand, um, how the Navy um, operated and, and, how, and how the Navy and Marine Corps did things in terms of, uh, of close air support. So that's the US Navy we've covered. We've covered the, uh, uh, and I should say that the Task Force 77, there's usually about two or three carriers off the, uh, off the coast of, of Korea throughout the war um, doing their thing. And finally, we've got the good old South African Air Force, uh, two squadrons of the South African Air Force. And this is very much a political statement because all through World War II, the South African Air Force has basically been part of the, the RAF. The, the, the South Africans said, right, here you are, here's our squadrons, and you, you keep them as part of yours. Um, the only rider really is that, is that we like them to operate in sort of Africa, stroke the, the Mediterranean, rather than being operating over, over Europe. Um, but they're, they're yours and you can do that because we're great fans of the Brits, etc. Except that the nationalist government then took over in, I think, probably 1945 and 46, and they said, well, we hate the Brits because of the Boer War, which, you know, don't forget the Boer War, and therefore we're going to do our own thing. And when the Korean War kicked off, suddenly there's this wonderful opportunity, right, well, why don't we support the Americans, and um, the Americans think we're great, and also at the same time, we'll do it behind the Brits' back, so we show them that we don't like them anymore. And that's what happened. So two squadrons of the Second Air Force was sent out to Korea. It was equipped by the Americans with, uh, with Mustangs and uh, fought a very long and hard and bitter um, campaign out there along with everybody else and did an absolutely fantastic job. But they were very, very much, you know, in the American camp, nothing to do with the British Commonwealth. Thank you very much. So that, so that I think, is, is pretty much all the players, if I haven't missed anybody out, which I hope I haven't. I think that's everything. So you've got a very broad mix of... <laughs> You can say lots of people dabbling in this one. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's, that's the interesting bit of it. It's, it's, it's this incredible mixture of of people, airplanes, tactics, and God knows what else. It's a, it's a, it's a real, real mix match. Uh, yeah. Let's yeah. You, you've mentioned the planes briefly. Let's get onto the kit because it is yeah. a fascinating mix. <laughs> if, if if you you know if, if you're a model modeler, this is this is the one you you want to play with because it has got literally everything. It does. Um, yeah. Yeah. Even even though the Americans changed a lot of P's to F's, just to just to confuse <laughs> yes. things. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's let's get let's get the big the the big two off. We're going to go into the the saber and the MiG fifteen a bit later. Yeah. But but these these are the ones that capture everybody's imagination, isn't it? Yeah, well, and, and and the sabers on the cover of your book, so you know it must be capturing yeah, everybody's. Yeah. It must be, yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, you know, that that's the sort of the, the iconic airplane, the iconic image of the of the Korean War is is, is probably the saber. 
and largely I think because most of the um, books on the subject and Frederick Austin's subject are, are American, shall I say. But certainly, it was it was a, it was a wonderful airplane, really fantastic machine, um, very well designed, wonderful aerodynamics, and yeah, we, we're going to talk about it in, in in a bit. But yes, that that that's the sort of iconic airplane. Um, the second one is the MiG fifteen, um, and again, people tend to say, well, it, it, yeah, it's a bit of rubbish, really. It was yeah, Russian crap, and uh, you know, it's uh, built like a tractor. Actually, that's so, so wrong because it was a fantastic. It was actually outperformed. It outperformed the Sabre in most regimes of flight. It was a. It, it was a much better aerodynamic airplane. It was a very sturdy machine. It probably was a bit like a tractor, um, but you know, in in the environment of Korea, that, that that was ideal. So, and you know, hundreds and hundreds of these things were operated, and the Russians used loads and loads of them. And of course, the Chinese used them as well, and eventually the North Koreans did as well. So although the Sabre kind of equipped almost all, all the US unit fighter and fighter bomb units by the end of the war, the very many more um, MiG-15 units were, were, were operating north of the border out of Manchuria. So <clears throat> MiG-15's got that whopping great 30 millimeter cannon on it as well, isn't it? it? Well, that, that, and we'll talk about that in a bit as well, because that, of course that's the massive difference is, is your, you know, your F-86 is armed with um, six um, 50 cal uh, machine guns. The, um, yeah, the MiG-15 designed really to take out bombers, and that's what it's there for. And there's enormous great 37 millimeter, I think that's an anti-tank gun, isn't it? So, and also two 23 mil cannons as well. So it's had a massive firepower. Um, very slow rate of fire, which uh, you know, again, we, we we'll talk about later, probably when we start talking about air, air combat. But um, but yeah, the, 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 the Russians sort of had a very very different design philosophy, I guess. So you've got this very maneuverable airplane, this massive punch that it, that it can deliver as well. So so that's those are the two iconic airplanes. Those were the airplanes which um, were the most successful, really, because they were they were modern. They were sort of second generation swept wing aircraft. Um, the earlier ones were. Although there are probably more of them around, and I'm looking at the F-84, the F-80, and then naval fighters like the, the, the Panther and the Banshee, um, straight-winged airplanes, um, sorry, the Meteor too, really, um, very, therefore limited by aerodynamics uh, in, in what they could do. And, and all of those really were ended up being relegated to, although they're supposedly fighter airplanes who actually uh, spent their whole time really um, moving mud, really, um, ground attack aircraft, really. <clears throat> it's, it's one of the things I always, I always find... I, I, I giggle to myself about it, but no one else probably finds it funny. But again, it's North, oh, Amer- it's North American <laughs> aviation overshadowing Republic. So th- their Sabre gets all the glory like the Mustang did, whereas Republic's Thunderjet, which did incredible work, especially in the ground attack role, yeah. get, you know, was overshadowed much like the Thunderbolt was in, in the previous war. Yeah, yes, yes. So I suppose that goes on to, yeah, well... Yeah. At least they're going back in the Vietnam War, I suppose, the 105. <laughs> but yes, you're, you're, yes, yeah, you're right. And, and as you say, you know, some fantastic work that was done by the uh, you know, the F-84, particularly uh, in, in the ground attack world. I mean, that had gone out as a, and it, it was designed as an escort fighter. Um, in fact, the first group out there, I can't remember, it's on the 27th um, fighter escort wing went out there. And the idea was that they, they were going to protect the MiG, uh, sorry, the, the B-29s, because the B-29s were taking a bit of a hammering from the from MiG-15s, uh, as, as one would expect. And so, right, we're going to send out the fighter escort group. And uh, they went out there and it, it all ended in tears, really. So they said, well, I'll tell you what, you can drop bombs instead. And they ended up being very, very good at that. And, the, you know, the, the same true, actually, the Meteor as well, which, uh, you know, they, they tried to use as a fighter airplane, but was, <laughs> ended up being utterly useless. So but very effective as a, as a ground attack machine. So, yeah, th- those are the, the jet fighters, really. Um, but as you say, it kind of takes the shot, or they, they take the spotlight, but um, m- much of the work, and probably most of the work, was actually done by good old World War II piston engine aircraft, which, which I guess it brings us back to good old linking in with World War II. Isn't, isn't that good how we all go around in little circles like it's, this? It's almost like we've planned this. It's yeah, so you <laughs> could imagine we had. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, we start off with our F-80 shooting star. And what I didn't mention, because I was babbling about other things, about the, the USAF um, out in uh, the 5th Air Force out in Japan, was that they had um, a number of squadrons of, of F-80s. And these were also F-82 night fighters, which we'll talk about in a bit. But, but these were all fighter air, air to air stuff. And they were all fighter pilots. And they went off and they did lots of combat, you know, fighting each other and lots of, you know, shooting at, um, at flags and things. Working with the army, no, not interested in that. We're going to do that. Australians can do that. We're going to we're going to fight each other, and that's what they did. So, and the F eighty was a very short range airplane. So when the war kicked off, these airplanes were based in Japan, and the war kicked off in on the thirty eighth parallel, and you measure that's a long way. 
And so <laughs> they started off realizing that the North Korean army was overwhelmingly thrashing the um, small South Korean army. And the only way that they were gonna stop it was through air power. So they start, so they said, right guys, you know, you think you find a bollocks, but off you go, you actually have to go and drop bombs now. And so the guys did, they did a great job, except that um, they, the range was such by the time they got to wherever the the other tanks and things were they had about five minutes to find a target bomb it and then then it's time to come home before they run out of fuel in fact quite a few did run out of fuel and there quite a few that ended up sort of flaming out and crashing in the, the in the sea on the way home and things like that but the the one airplane that was there were two airplanes which which were eminently suitable for for, for, for this job one was the f-51 mustang um, of world war ii fame long range airplane um, could loiter for hours, you know, could go off and spend half an hour plus you know, loitering around, shooting at tanks and doing whatever. Um, the only drawback is that um, loitering around shooting at tanks means you get shot at by uh, anti-aircraft artillery. Um, jet aircraft, a quite a big problem, but you know, if you end up with a bullet through a, a, a jet engine, it's basically a sort of Bunsen burner in a, in a tin can. If you punch a hole in it, then it's, got a, it's, it's a Bunsen burner tin can with a hole in it. So it carries on going. Uh, Piston engine airplane, massive, great big sort of um, bit of machinery, lots of reciprocating bits and pieces and things opening and cooling systems have gone as well. Put a bullet through that and it's pretty well knackered. So the the Mustang was was very vulnerable to ground fire, um, which is why the F-80 pilots weren't terribly keen when the USAF said, well, clearly your airplane's unsuitable and we need to re-equip you or unequip you, shall we say, back with the F-51 that you used to fly two years ago. And so bizarrely, the F-80, which replaced the Mustang, was replaced by the <laughs> Mustang. <laughs> and um, the F-80 units, very or, or most of them, re-equipped with the Mustang, which was an eminently more suitable airplane for, for use um, uh, in, in the air to ground mode. The other airplane, and I, I, I briefly touched on it, was the F-82, the twin Mustang. So these two Mustangs bolted together. That's what it looks like. I think it was actually built as one airplane, but it actually looks like two that's been built, bolted together with a huge, great sort of... Um, radar dish hanging between them and this was the prime all-weather fighter of the uh, of the fifth air force i remember building a model of that as a kid and finishing it and going what on earth did they it, do I that? Know, it, looks, it looks like a pig's ear <laughs> <laughs> uh, but apparently it, it was actually quite effective in what it did so we've got these airplanes which are night fighters and the and, the, and uh, we're, we're, I'm, I'm afraid i'm zinging backwards and forwards through, through the freeway but so we're on day two now and we need to evacuate all the uh, American uh, civilians from, from Seoul and the general area, the, the military advisors, et cetera. And we need to make sure the Koreans don't, you know, the Korean Yak 9s, which are still in range of that, uh, you know, don't, don't meddle. So we, the only airplanes that we can send there are the F 82. So these airplanes are sent across there. So guys who have been basically night fighter pilots, they go out at, at night in crappy weather when nobody else flies, and uh, they fly around and intercept people using radars, and it's all jolly exciting. And suddenly, instead, they're sent out to be day fighters, but miles away from home. Excuse me, <laughs> we didn't sign up for this. And again, it shows the incredible, I think, uh, flexibility of, of, of the USAF that they were able to do that. And um, yeah, again, that's why, what, uh, going back to the, the F-80s and, uh, and the Mustangs, that these guys were just incredibly flexible, you know, and it, it, it just shows the quality of, of guys that, that, you know, the, the USAF pilots of, of, of the day, um, that they could do that. So the F-82 uh, is suddenly, uh, twin Mustangs, re-rolled into being a, a day fighter, and, and it's quite successful. They take out a few, um, a few Yak-9s, which is uh, all good stuff. And then later, um, they, they, they get moved on to doing night intruder stuff. So flying around, uh, you know, again, bombing, uh, bombing things at night. So uh, again, it's, it's quite a good airplane for that. So we've got the F-82s, the, the, the Mustangs then. The, uh, I mentioned the Yak-9s, which um, uh, the, the North Koreans started with. Um, again, a, a nice little airplane, very short range, and actually ended up being sort of outclassed by, by the various American aircraft, like, like the Mustang. Then the, the LA Lavochkin airplanes, uh, big radial engine fighters, again, that's some, used a little bit um, by the North Koreans, um, used as night fighters, actually, initially by, by the Soviets, um, until they realized it, it, wasn't, it wasn't as effective in terms of, of, of a quick climb to height to try and find a B-29. You're better off in a MiG-15, so, uh, so they used those a bit. Um, but the, the, my little favorites, the Polikarov, um, so that's my phone going in the background, they would ignore that, uh, the Polikarov, um, Po 2, which was a little sort of biplane trainer airplane. And um, very quickly after the um, North Koreans had, you know, had found that most of their, their yaks and, and, and Sturmwerks had been shot down, 
they decided they're going for guerrilla warfare instead. And the, the means of doing this was, was this, these little airplanes um, and learning really from what they, the, the, you know, the night witches, the, you know, the, the Russian women fighters at night, um, night fighters of, of World War II, they lob some, you know, get some um, bombs in the back of it and then potter across to um, Seoul or to, to the American bases later on during the war and just throw out a whole lot of bombs. And it wasn't they did a lot of damage, but they did a massive amount of morale, um, uh, you know, sort of busting, as it were, you know, because there's nothing worse than being you know, chucked out of your bed at two o'clock in the morning by a whole lot of you know, bombs coming down. Um, and even more frustrating for you know, the Americans, particularly, is you've got you know, eventually when they end up with these uh, really um, souped up uh, night fighters. And we, we, yeah, we, we kind of miss those actually, but you know, things like um, you know, F 92 and also the um, Sky Knight. And these so radar equipped night fighters, but also, I mean, they, they got the, the um, FOU Corsair with a, the night fighter version of that with the big radar on it. They couldn't, they couldn't find these things because the, the Polikarkov went so slowly and was made out of wooden canvas and all the other sort of good things that, you know, you couldn't find it on radar. If you did find it, it was going so slowly, you couldn't attack it. And so these things were floating around almost at will, do, you know, uh, uh, and completely immune initially, at least, um, to, to, um, to, to night fighters. And that was a you know, cause of frustration. It's 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 amazing that something that looks like an Avro 504K is causing <laughs> yeah. so much trouble <laughs> yeah, to, to two major wars on. Yeah, it does. It looks like an Avro 504K that somebody's put it built upside down or built back to front. Of yeah. <laughs> Even so, you're right. It's amazing, really, isn't it? And it's you know it's amazing what you can do with uh, yeah with very little really. And um, then we've got the sort of big navy fights. I mentioned the Corsair, the F4U. Um, and the uh, because again on on the carriers, uh, the US carriers. The, the fighters were, were jet fighters, banshees and, 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 uh, and panthers. And the idea was they'd use the uh, Corsairs and the AD Sky Raider, which had just come into service uh, for, for ground attack. And again, the Sky Raider, massive uh, radio engine machine, which uh, could go for hours and hours and take you know, tons and tons and tons of bombs that saw its way through uh, Vietnam as well, was uh, very widely used. Um, uh, it was also used as a torpedo bomber actually against the, one of the dams in, um, <laughs> in Korea as well. But again, uh, a, a lot of the ground attack work by the U.S. Navy uh, flying these Corsairs and Corsairs, as indeed did the U.S. Marine Corps. So the, the, the Marines operating these aircraft as well in close support role um, at, at night and everything else. Um, the the Royal Navy ended up with they arrived firstly with uh, fireflies and uh, and sea fires, which uh, firefly troops obviously fairly useless. The sea fire again <laughs> shot down by B-29s who thought they were Yak nines. <laughs> A, a, a friend, friend, of, friend of the show is a, a big fan of of the fairy firefly, so I'm going to send that clip to you, Matt. When you, when you hear this. <laughs> yes, I, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> Again, so the firefly used basically is a, a ground attack, um, ground attack aircraft. The problem with the Royal Navy aircraft was they're all very short range airplanes. So Sea Fire went almost nowhere. I mean, Sea Fire wasn't a very robust airplane either. So that, that, that those those are written off just in landing accidents because it. it you know, it, it was not a, not a very strongly built airplane, um, and they, they Triumph used them at the beginning. But actually, they were then replaced by the Sea Fury, which is a much more um, more robust, a powerful, and, um, and generally impressive machine. Very much the sort of ultimate um, piston engine fighter, as far as we, as we Brits are, are concerned. So um, that was used by by the um, by the Royal Air Force and the Royal Australian Navy as well. Sorry, the Royal Navy, should I say, the Royal Australian Navy both used um, the Sea Fury and, and, and the Firefly as well. When, when, and, and then a, we come... when you want a jo job done properly, go go see Sydney Cam. He'll he'll sort you out. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So, to all this, to all the Spitfire people that are listening, that got go to get that in. Yeah. Um, and yeah, finally we've got the B twenty nine, um, which I've kept the the best of last almost. Um, B B twenty nine, the super fortress, the um, super heavy bomber of World War Two, is now classed as a medium bomber. <laughs> it's been demoted, <laughs> and um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier on massively misused um you know, it's a strategic bomber so it is it is used for um uh, for, for doing some strategic bombing and again it's quite interesting that <laughs> the, the americans started doing strategic bombing of, of north um, korea uh, and then halfway well in, in the first sort of you know, few months and then of course when um they landed um up um, at Incheon and then started moving northwards. We went, oh, hang on a minute. We don't want all the bridges destroyed. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we better stop that. And, and so that came to halt until, uh, until the Chinese came in and, and drove all it out again. But yeah, so used against strategic targets, um, sometimes very accurately, sometimes not so accurately. Uh, very early on, there was already against one San oil refinery, uh, which they claimed to have flattened. And then when the US Navy went back there about a month later, they said, well, it seems to be intact for us. <laughs> 
uh, bridges, trying to take out all the bridges around because um, North Korea particularly is intersected by lots of east-west flowing rivers. So if you can drop the bridges, then you make things life difficult for, um, for, for people trying to resupply armies and things. So massive amount of effort um, against bridges with not a huge amount of success. We tried some of the Razon bombs, these um, you know, radio control things, um, which some of which were, again, it's a learning curve. I think initially they didn't, but then as they worked out how to use them, they, uh, they got better. But, but, but actually mainly it was sort of carpet bombing, sort of trying to, trying to hit bridges. Some very accurate, there's a fantastic, we, we mentioned images in the book. And, um, and so because nobody can see it, we'll now talk about it again. Um, there's one of, of the airfield at Sam Shan. And uh, you can, it's by the Chongchong River, which you can see, you can see the outline of the airfield, the peri, uh, perimeter track of the taxiways, the, um, you can see the revetments that have been built and dispersals. <clears throat> and where there should be a runway, you just see a whole line, a runway shaped line of bombs all exploding. And that is just incredibly accurate. I was thinking that's an amazing bit of bombing. So on a good day, they did a fantastic job. But, but going back to earlier to what I was saying about being misused, again, desperately trying to run around in circles and please the army, um, some of these B-29s were used for close air support, would you believe it? So the, the FAC said, hi, you know, for whatever formation you are, and what have you got for me today? Expecting I've got 200 pound bombs. So we got <laughs> 50, 500 pound bombs. What? <laughs> and similarly, they were used for um, armed reconnaissance along roads and things, particularly in, in, in the initial stage of the war. So oh, fly B-29 along a road, and if you see something, bomb it. Well, that's all well and good, but yeah, by the time you've seen it, you then go try to set yourself up for a rear attack, and in a big aeroplane, that takes a long time, and you've got crews that haven't been trained to do that. You know, they're, they're, they're trained to bomb big factories and things. So it was a complete misuse and abuse, really, of, of, of the aeroplane and, and, uh, and their power in general. But yeah, the massive strategic bombing campaign over North uh, Korea, bearing in mind that most of the, the big factories and things uh, were up in the northern bit, covered by MiG-15. So some, sometimes when um, you know, they, they, they had massive losses uh, eventually for, during the daytime um, through, through the MiG-15s and eventually switched to night, uh, night bombing. So again, later on, Again, continuing to, 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 to do a lot of work, but, but mainly at night for the second half of the war. It's, it's very much they had a lot of stuff that they were trying to use and not, oh, yeah. not, not always the right, the right jobs for those, those bits of kit that come, that come into it. Well, I, I think in, initially, I mean, it, it was, you know, uh, you know, harking back to what I mentioned, you know, the, 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 certainly the Western side, and I think the Russians were, were, were very much on, on the rundown, ha having had World War II. Thanks very much, Steve. We don't need to do big air force anymore. We, we'll run them down. Where don't we need them? Or we don't need them in Japan. So the, there was it, really the war had to be fought with whatever happened to be at ha on hand at the time, and, um, and and then whatever could be scrounged elsewhere. So you're right; it was a kind of a, you know, a, a bit of everything just thrown into the melting pot to try and make it work, really, rather than any sort of strategic view of right. What do we need? It was right. What you know? What what can we get away with? What do we need you know, right now to, that can drop a bomb or, or shoot a bullet or whatever? Um, okay. We've we've been waffling on enough, but haven't we? Just let's let's, <laughs> let's get to the bit that, as much as I I find that the B twenty nine use in, in Korea absolutely fascinating because it's yeah. it's it's again working out all the stuff they thought they'd worked out, you know, over Japan and realizing actually that we we we, we might we might need to do this again. The, the the point about Korea is in, initially it is a very fluid situation. The the front line is moving north and south at, at a great rate of knots. Um, yeah, before. MacArthur probably pushed too far north than he should have, but we won't get into yep. that. <laughs> but the result is we have the creation of Migali, which is what I think everybody's come here to to hear about. So yeah. let's talk about the jet to jet stuff up up on the up on the Po River. Yeah, let's do that. Well, the um, the so Mig Alley then is uh, is actually quite a in comparison to the size of it, quite a small bit of airspace, really. It's um, the Yalu it's River, a, not the Po River. Yeah, well, yeah, I know what you meant. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So it's um, so it runs from the Yalu River and then down towards the Chongchong River, which is not a massive bit of space, and, it, and it's sort of tr a triangle back. Uh, and the reason it's that shape is because the um, the the Chinese stroke Soviet airfields in in Manchuria, but uh, basically the they start off with with near uh, Antung, which is now known as Dandong. Um, and then about 100 miles northwest of that, up uh, around Laoyang and that sort of area, um, what is now, um, I think, Shenyang was um, something else. <laughs> they, they've, they've changed all the names. Um, 
and so you, you're kind of drawing a, a, a radius from the from those. And although there were more airfields that ended up with, I started with just Antong, one airfield up, uh, up there, and then we ended up adding um, four, or, yeah, four new ones got built in, in the space of the wall, but all that area. And so you're drawing an arc around around those really. Um, and again, a short range airplane, the, the, the MiG-15, so it didn't, it didn't really go that far. Um, the Russians were very, very keen to make sure that nobody knew they were there. They were very keen not to be seen fighting the Americans in public, as it were. Um, so the aircraft, in fact, initially when they arrived, the, the, the guys were given a sort of, you know, here's your Korean phrase book, so, you know, sort of <laughs> break left. Uh, I am engaging the, you know, the airplane ahead of me, which I think they very quickly went out the window as they realized that wasn't going to work. But the airplanes were all painted in North Korean color, colors and the pilots were not allowed to fly over the sea. Um, they were not allowed to fly over the sea because if they jumped out, they might be captured by, you know, by, by American, the American Navy because the, 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 you know, the, the US Navy had, well, there, there was a US Navy and there wasn't <laughs> really a Soviet one around there. Mig Alley is just the, the, the sort of triangle between these rivers, but it's, it's where most of the action takes place because the link through Manchuria uh, around um, uh, Sinua Ju and, um, and uh, Antung and that is, is where all the supplies are coming across, where all the... Um, the reinforcements for the, for the you know, Chinese reinforcements are coming across. So if you can cut the, the, the links, the bridges there, they're good. That's where all the um, supply dumps are going to be. That's where they've started to try and build airfields on the sort of northern side of it. So you can take those out, then all for well and good. So there's ammunition depots, there's all sorts of stuff, all in that corner, all protected by the MiGs. So that's why there's this sort of great interest in, in flying in that area and, and why, well, why the, the MiGs are there really, to shoot down or, or, or stop anything that flies in effort from actually bombing anything important. So that, that's where MiG Alley comes in. And then we've got, we, we've already mentioned the, the MiG-15 and initially the F-80 and the, um, the F-84, but um, as, we've, as, as we mentioned, they're not terribly success, successful in, in fighting the MiG-15. And the reason is down to this business of swept wings. The reason is because jet fighters go further, fly faster, fly higher, and actually go for, uh, faster and higher, and, uh, and either faster or, far, or higher or both. Um, so you end up getting uh, uh, affected by, by Mach effect. By, you know, if you get close to the speed of sound, you end up with shockwaves forming on the airplane. And if you've got a straight winged airplane, <laughs> basically you're stuffed because A, it, it, it has a massive amount of drag, so the thing won't go any faster, and B, you end up with shockwaves on, on control surfaces and God knows what else, which make the airplane handling really quite awkward and, and uncomfortable um, and possibly, you know, you will lose control of the airplane. So until you slow down or find thicker air or whatever. Um, so whereas in your swept wing airplane, uh, you, can, you can quite happily operate in, 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 you know, up in the, in, in the high um, subsonic Mach numbers, you know, between nine and, uh, and, and you know, nine, eight, nine, nine, you can actually, you know, fly supersonic as well. Uh, and, you know, with, with, with um, obviously going downhill, but uh, with no um, you know, adverse effects. Jet fighters, as opposed to the propeller aircraft in, in, in World War II, the, the, you know, the engagements are much, much bigger, take a much bigger um, bit of sky because of the speed that people are moving and much higher, starting up you know, 40 or 50,000 feet um, you know, quite often being used. So you've, you've, you've got all sort of the, the, the handling uh, problems of, you know, up there, you don't have a lot of excess power. So trying to keep in formation, you don't, um, you know, if, if, you, if you're lagging a bit, then you can't get back in because you haven't got power on the airplane to do that. Once you start manoeuvring, you know, once you're very close to the aircraft um, ceiling, then there, there's not much turn uh, performance there. But once you do start a turning fight, you, you know, to try and keep the G loads on, you, you, you know, let's say you're in a Sabre and you've got a MiG-15 behind you, you, you pull back and then you start descending and, you, and you're keeping this G uh, force going. So up from 40 odd thousand feet all the way down past the ground level before you lose the guy, you're pulling four, five, six Gs, an awful lot. And okay, there, there was probably quite a lot of, of, of G um, involved in, in World War II um, fighter attacks, but probably not an awful lot because the, the, air, the airplanes didn't have that much power, that much speed in, in comparison. The interesting, the Americans ha had um, anti-G protection in the aircraft. So G suits that the pilots wore, that gives you a couple of G protection. The MiG-15 had no such thing. So the, the um, Soviet um, and later Chinese pilots we would find it really quite exhausting, uh, you know, these long engagements. So you know, in, your MiG, in your F-86, if you went into a spiral dive, you'd probably get away from the MiG. Conversely, of course, the MiG actually had a much better climb performance than the, than the, the Soviet. So if you, <laughs> something which some 
mig punts didn't learn was actually all they had to do was roll wings level and pull up and then you were safe because you know you had a better zoom performance actually you had a better, better climb performance and a better ceiling than, than, than a saber so that that was the, the means of escaping because it's considerably um, lighter than the saber isn't it the big 50 <clears throat> yeah I, I don't know the figs off the top of my head but certainly it had a, it, it, it it flew higher and and had a much better rate of climb that, that was a, you know they were actually very closely matched airplanes um but that the, the advantage was was in the mig with was with the mig in terms of of climbing and the uh, and, and ceiling yeah that that that's yeah this whole why, why the swept wing airplanes were so much better than, than, than the straight wing, the straight winged ones should i say and um and so why why i really it, it ended up as being a sort of duel between the, the mig 15s and the the sabers so the mig 15s trying to get to the bombers the sabers trying to stop them from doing that and that's actually one of the things to to remember what i think we'll talk about kill claims and things in, in a bit but one of the um i call it a myth really is that um the um, the claim that well you know the sabers shot down the ten migs for every every saber loss, and I I don't buy that for a number of reasons. But one of which is of course that the mig wasn't you know, the 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 saber was fighting the mig full stop, but actually the mig wasn't fighting just the saber. It was fighting the saber, but it was also fighting the you know deal of the above the airplanes that we've already mentioned. So um, you know what you need to add all that into the equation as well, and and also need to remember that the whereas the F eighty six was there simply to shoot down migs to to you know to stop them. Um, engaging the, the bombers that of course in, in your mid-15 you, you basically try to stop the bombers from dropping their bombs accurately so if you can attack somebody and you don't shoot them down but they drop their you know they, they, they miss or they jettison their weapons then actually you've just uh, you know you, you've, you've achieved what you want to achieve it, it's like comparing apples with pears in many respects but again there, there are other aspects to, to that particular um statistic as well which we can go into in a bit if you if you're still awake I, we're, 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 we're gonna we're, we're gonna have to because it's 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 a fascinating argument but you know it, it's it's interesting you mentioned because you know we, we we forgot to mention you're an, you're an ex-tornado pilot so you, yeah that's right <laughs> you, you have a little bit of experience about flying fast jets and i guess how you mentioned it briefly there that that amount of energy that they were carrying through these dogfights that was probably the the sort of main difference between say a, a second world war dogfight and a korean one is just the the constant speed you you're, you're not getting any respite from it are you you're you're in you're in high g maneuvers for long periods of time just trying to get that same split second that every fighter pilot's after well that's right yeah and in fact oddly enough i um i did a, a quick little swatting bit last night and read through there's a british report raised about we're comparing the two lessons from korea and it talked about the difference in, in performance um and but one of the things it also mentioned was that, of course, in you know, jet fighter combat, the speeds are also much higher than was the case with piston engine fighters. And the interesting about that was that then pilots who were used to flying piston engine aircraft were not good at judging the amount of deflection that you needed because they were used to things moving at a certain speed and so it allowed that much deflection, but actually the thing was moving much faster, so you end up shooting behind it. The mental muscle memory still hadn't recalculated. Well, that's, that's, that's right, yeah. And, and, and so that was, again, one of the, one of the things just, as, as I sort of alluded to a little bit earlier, it's just simply the size of, of, of the fights, so that in comparison to the sort of very much knife fight in a, in a phone box type sort of thing that, that was going on um, in, in World War II, these are actually, you know, the, the, these are sort of um, massive things that, that, you know, where, where it's taking you miles to t turn a corner up at, you know, 40 or thousand feet where you haven't got a lot of um, manoeuvre margin. <clears throat> these, the, the, these take up a lot of sky um, and, and that's a, another big difference as well. But yes, the amount of energy that's, that, 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 that's involved in, in, in all that, that combat is, you know, in comparison, again, is it, quite phenomenal really. Let's let's get this out of the way, but the, the, mm. the claims versus kill thing, because, you know, the... Yeah. the when, when you look at the politics of, of, of Korea, sort of as soon as the, you know, the, the front line stabilizes after the, the Chinese involvement and it becomes quite a stalematey thing. And of course, you have some incredibly big, bloody battles on the ground, but that's not interesting to people at home. Which is a <laughs> no, <it isn't>. <laughs> but big, big, shiny yeah. silver jets that keeps people's interesting because it is slightly science fictiony. And yeah, we get but... we get into this really interesting you know the, the ace race and you, you've right, got very yeah, yeah very 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 famous second world war fighter pilots trying to get their double a statuses and it all gets a little bit murky doesn't it well yeah it does um but here, here's the interesting thing i think almost every every air war that there's ever been ever um the the number of or, or pilots 
underestimate the amount of damage they do to other airplanes. So every single one, so, you know, probably since whenever it was that somebody first took a shot, pot shot on an old bloke with his revolver, um, the claims of kills against the actual damage done is, is vastly different. Um, and so the only way that you can compare things really is, is, to, is to look at losses and go, well, these airplanes were lost this day, so we know that they, they were shot down damaged. Again and again, that's that's the thing. Is what's a clear, you know, what, what's a kill? If you shoot an airplane and it explodes, obviously it's a kill. But what happens if you shoot an airplane and the guy thinks, "Well, I better land now." Is that a kill? <laughs> I don't know. So uh, yeah, I suppose that's damaged or whatever. Uh, but so, but I don't believe that any of the claims that were made were done. Um, you know, I, I think that they were all made in very good faith. That the pilots who claimed those kills actually believed that they had achieved them and. There are a number of factors here, because obviously in World War One with a revolver, you know, it was your word against somebody else's. Uh, but by the time World War Two has sort of run through its course, we're, we've got gun camera films, and we so now to claim a kill, you have to have shot somebody down clearly, uh, but you also need either a somebody to have witnessed it, or b and or b. Um, some footage on your gun camera that shows that you've done so. So the first one, A, the uh, the witness, and the problem with that is that people, I mean, it's all the whole thing about eyewitnesses, you know, what do you, what you actually see against reality, you know, are, is is very different. Um, and, and that's- Air in combat, all, Rashomon. Pati well, particularly, because if you can imagine the sort of airplanes all sort of smashing around each other at high energy and, you know, you're concentrating on what's happening, uh, what's happening behind you, who's around and what's happening in front of you, um, I, again, I, I know from my own experience of um, uh, you know, particularly flying the Hawk, which was you know, high G, whizzing around you very quickly, lose track of what on earth's going on. And did you see that airplane shot down? Yes, I did. So three pilots might claim an airplane, and it might be the same airplane. I, it's you know that kind of stuff. So we can, to an extent, discount eyewitnesses as being particularly reliable. Um, we can, to an extent, discount guys claiming what they saw themselves oh i shot this airplane and it exploded because well here's the example the first the, 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 supposedly the first um jet versus jet combat um uh, victory by uh, brown uh christian name forgotten fat shoots down mig 15 really well no let's paint a picture it's a it's a um it's a hazy sort of um, autumn day there's a, a classic sort of high pressure there's a massive um, inversion of about 10,000 feet with uh, haze and stuff below it. Uh, the guy's meeting clear airspace above and uh, Brown sees a MiG-15 in front of him and fires at it and um, he, he gets a couple of hits actually, one of which goes through a, a drop tank. He, he sees it, uh, flay, uh, smoke coming out of it, so in his mind it's, it's burst into on fire. It then plummets earthwards, uh, it explodes and then sort of, uh, hits the ground. Except that, that's not what actually happened. As I say, he, he, so he puts a bullet through this guy's um, fuel, uh, fuel tank, his, his underwing tank. And uh, what happens if you, um, you know, put a hole through a fuel tank? Well, fuel comes out. And what happens if you put fuel comes out at you know, 20 odd thousand feet? It vaporizes. So uh, immediately you get this plume of white stuff, which is actually just vaporizing fuel coming out. I haven't hurt anybody. Um, but a bloke in MIG thinks, well, this bloke just shot me. I think I'll. I'm a pretty much above the airfield. I think I'll just you know, get out of here now while the going's good before he does any more damage. So he just turns over and does his vertical dive down towards uh, towards the ground. And on his way down, and that's you know, 50,000 feet or whatever, he punches the um, the clear aircraft button and gets rid of the, the underwing tanks. Um, and to anybody looking down, you've seen this thing plummet down. You've seen um, smoke coming out the back, which isn't really smoke. And then you see these bits flying off it, um, you know, glittering silver bits coming off it, and then it disappears. Well, it disappears because it's just gone through the inversion layer and it's now in the haze beneath it. Um, so the reality is that the, the, I think the airplane landed and the bloke said, oh, some Yanks put a hole in the wing. Can you fix it? So Igor said, yeah, of course I can. So half an hour later, he said, I fixed it. So is that a kill? Oh, I don't think it is. But so that's the whole kind of eyewitness thing of what, what did you actually see? What actually happened? But th then, we, th then there's the film. So... Here's the first thing that so the Russians had had films and we've already talked about their cannon and all the rest of it, slow firing cannon. And here's the, here's the silly bit is their camera, gun camera film, did not have any overrun. So what that means is that when you take your finger off the trigger, you stop filming. So that means that you, the last shot is just as you took the shot, but it doesn't actually show you where the shells went. You have to guess that. The Russians later found that 25% 
of the uh, uh, of what were credited as, as kills by on film were actual kills. So 75 percent, three quarters of the claims that, that were actually credited on film with yes, you've definitely killed that were actually not um, were, were misses or, or, or damages or whatever. And there's a similar story to the F-86s um, and well and, and American aircraft in general. They did have overrun, but Here's the thing. If you, we've already talked about, um, you know, propeller aircraft and their vulnerability to to, to gunfire. Talked about the Mustang and you know, put, put a bullet in the engine, you knackered it. Put a bullet through a jet fighter, and yes, you've just got a you know Bunsen burner with a can with a hole in it. So if you fire lots of fifty cal bullets at a MIG and you hit it, you put a whole lot of holes through it that when it lands, it has stitched up, and, and you're fine again. Just to plug your book, there, Mike. There are some fantastic yes. images. <laughs> Migs with lots of damage, <laughs> and um, and and some of the gun camera yeah. ones, especially of of, of the B twenty nines. I've got um, Sergeant Lieutenant Nikolai yeah. shot here with the B twenty nine perfectly framed. There's it's as we were saying before that that big fifty cal debate yeah. of you don't do much damage, yeah. And that, that that's one of the things again that that, that they were aware of. I think they were looking at bringing twenty mil cannons in, but but actually what you've just flagged up is something else, which is an interesting story, which is that um, so when the Russians started fighting the B twenty nines. So bear in mind now, you're a Russian fighter pilot and you've done lots of practice and you've fought other fighters which have got a wingspan of 20 or 30 feet. So you're used to an airplane being a certain size in the, in the gun sight when you open fire. So when you roll in behind a B-29 and it gets to a certain size in the gun sight and you open fire, you miss because actually it's about three times as far away as it was. So you're actually out of range completely. And this was a big problem they had, was actually getting close enough to the B-29s to actually do any damage, to actually hit them because they, they, you know, you'd look at this massive airplane. Well, in order to be close enough to make sure you hit it, it has to look, it has to look massive, not just massive. And, and they were opening fire a long way out of range. So again, that, that, that's, a, that's another problem. So, so you have on the, you know, the, the Americans claiming hills, which weren't because they were just putting a hole, you know, they, they were hitting or may have been hitting the airplane, but actually weren't doing any, any critical damage. The Russians who were claiming kills, but actually were missing, possibly. Because um, again, you'd know if you got hit by a MiG-37 uh, mil cannon because, well, in fact, Graham Hulse, who was the highest scoring British pilot, was actually killed exactly that. He, went, he, he was shooting at a, a MiG-15 and uh, scored some hits on it, which was enough to slow it down. Uh, and of course, he then had so much overtake, he went straight in front of it. And when he went in front of it, the Russian pilot rolled out, fired about three shells, one of which was a 37 mil, which took off um, his, his wing. Yeah, that, that's how much damage a 37 mil hit did to, to, to a high speed saber. It actually took the wing off. Um, so the, the, there are these reasons why claims were made and the re these reasons why the claims were, you know, perhaps not, um, w were not substantiated in, in, in reality. And, and that's, I think, where the sort of myth, but again, um, we uh, uh, digressing and moving on, <laughs> you mentioned that, uh, you know, the sort of ace race, and it certainly did get into that. And I think that certainly initially the, um, both sides were, were very, um, you know, very, very careful about what was allowed to be a claim. I think in, in the Russia, you had to have a film and they had to find the wreckage. Of course, for the Americans, you couldn't find wreckage because it was somewhere over North Korea. But um, it, towards the end, it was all just getting too difficult. So they just sort of took people's words and look, looked at the film. But yes, the, the, the whole ace race thing came on. And one of the things which, again, seemed ridiculous to the guys at the time was so the Soviet uh, MiGs are based just over the border in Manchuria. They're not allowed to fly Manchuria because the Russians, well, I mean, it's fair enough, really, because you know, start World War Three if the Americans start floating around China. So let's not do that, chaps. Except that if you're in, you know, quote, hot pursuit, unquote, then, then we'll let you. So then hot pursuit sort of gets moved. And, and what it ends up with is, well, uh, what happens if we're going to go into preemptive hot pursuits? What we're going to do is we're going to sit over the airfield, and when we see people taking off, then we're going to pursue them. And so that's hot pursuit. <laughs> this is called hawking, and it's strictly speaking against the rules of or political rules. However, um, it makes absolute sense, so you can see why they did it. But what that transpires to is that a large number of of air-to-air -air kills were claimed against uh, MiG-15s that were only just in the air. So. You, again, you're comparing apples with, with pears if, if you're comparing MiGs shooting sabres in full-blown combat at height to uh, sabres shooting MiGs that are just about to land or have just taken off. Um, again, different thing. But again, and again, let's move in, and, and another thing, because there's, there's just so many facets to this. Um, firstly, um, the... There's, there's the Chinese side of it. We don't know the Chinese losses. They've never admitted it. You know, the, the, the Russians, we can find out what they lost because the, the, the records are out there. 
Chinese, we don't know. What we do know is that a large number of Chinese uh, pilots are, are rolled in with you know, maybe 15 hours experience, so very, very inexperienced. Uh, we know that they tend to fire off in these massive great sort of trains of 30 or 40 airplanes at a time. Um, we know that they probably are a bit reluctant. They, they know they're not that hot. So they are not going to engage a saber unless they, they know that they're going to get it, unless they can see a massive advantage. And actually, again, because of the way that, that combat works you know, up at height, you quite often just don't see airplanes. So it's quite, you know, you could quite happily, um, and, and, and it wouldn't be abnormal to fly through the middle of a huge great dogfight that's going without seeing anybody. I mean, it's, it is quite possible to do that. So, so we don't know how, we, how the Chinese got on, but we suspect they probably lost quite a lot. We, they claim to have shot down quite a few uh, UN aircraft. Again, we, we're not sure some, some, undoubtedly they did, so that that's you know that, that that's into the equation as well. The other thing is that interestingly, um, uh, James Jabara, who was the first um, uh, U.S. Um, jet ace, did a tour in I think 1952, and he, he went back to the Central Fighter Establishment back in the U.K. and was giving a lecture. And he says that at that stage of the war, he thought that there was one uh, Russian MiG lost for every American Saber lost. So he he reckoned that it was about evens. And I think in air combat that is probably about right. If you put in the Chinese, then again, given that the inexperience of the Chinese uh, against very experienced, uh, particularly American um, fighter pilots, then you probably can say, yes, there probably were more MiG-15s on the Chinese side lost. And again, if you, if you roll in the, thanks a lot, we'll go across the border and shoot down guys when they're trying to land. So, but again, I don't think you'll get 10 to one, but I think you might get you know, one, or, you know, one or three to one, something, sorry, two or three to one, something that order, I think. Again, that's just a, a broad guess, but yeah, <laughs> who cares about the truth? <laughs> well, I, my 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 favorite my favorite line about claims is yeah. the Second World War, which was um, the the Belgian um, Cheval Lallemand saying about Frank Ziegler, the six hundred nine squadron spy, saying you could show up with the guy you shot down, with him begging to say that this is the man who shot you down, and and Ziggy Ziegler would still be questioning your claim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but before we went on there's there's a few things in korean books that i sort of pick up and and, and sort of immediately go to the index <laughs> oh, to dear. check out what, one of the things i was pleased about and we're not going to get to this real list thing um but is 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 all the debate about gabby gabreski because there was a great fighter pilot who's was in you know transformed his mm. unit got it incredibly aggressive and some books spend a lot of time in that I don't want to call it controversy because it's it's a lot of he said she said about uh, about his 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 behavior. But he he wanted his unit to be the best, exactly the same as he did during the Second World War. So it's mm -hmm. I always felt it was completely in character, and, and I like that you don't get into that. You you know you, you you mention his unit and you you continue to cover the wider thing because as much as I love James Salter's The Hunters, the um, the atmosphere that that book gives of a, a sort of conf a conflicted units desperately trying to get a stasis i think is kind of painted painted a lot of our our um our memories of of, of what a u.s unit was actually like yes I, I think that's true and as you say i think that a lot of egos started taking over towards the end and people were desperate to, to, you know, to get that fifth kill um <clears throat> three and check six by um boots bless which again the similar you know he extended his tour to you know just to get the extra you know and it almost doesn't matter who does it and i think he actually talked about one of the um wing commanders i can't remember because i think he was i don't think he was with Cabrera, he was with thing wasn't he with the, on the fourth um mm. of uh somebody not wanting him or or, or trying to get him posted be, before yeah, because he didn't want to get you know, there's this competition between them of, you know of, and yeah you're right i mean i think that does that does fit in, um, but I think I mean one of the things that has that has always struck me about, uh, and again when I read through it, I've talked about the flexibility of the, of the U.S. Air Force and it's done, and and what I've seen of the U.S. Air Force operating from my own uh, perspective is that it's an incredibly professional organisation, and I, you know, there are these great sort of ego things, and I don't know how much of that is bar talk, um, and again how much of it is is, is actual reality, because, you know, I, I can't, I don't believe that that people were that egotistical that they would sacrifice professionalism i think they would probably there were certainly a lot of egos around and there would certainly be a lot of sort of ego parading and all that but also almost 
sort of shaming in a way, making sure everybody, what you know, that you will be aggressive, you will do, you, know, you will be competitive, because that's what you need in a, in, in a fighter pilot who's going to go to you know, go across and make it out of take names, kick ass, and all the rest of it. So I, you know, I reckon that's fair enough. But yeah, I mean, in the book, I haven't mentioned that, and I, I've what I've tried to do is is to be completely unbiased, as it were, to to give the the, you know, the whole the big picture of, of, of everybody's point of view. So again claims i've 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 not gone into it well you know he shot down 15 people i've got you know i, I well i look at who 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 was shot down you know what what who's admitted losses so so i've done that through not through claims but through to actual losses where you know wherever i can and, and a couple of occasions i've mentioned where somebody says oh and they claimed blah 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 but then said but there is no you know the american strict russians do not um you know do not re record any corresponding claim what i've wanted to do is to present the facts if you like to such as I see them to the reader and let the reader make their own. I mean, I've drawn a few conclusions right at the end of the book, but, but basically the idea is that you read through it, it gives you the big picture, you form your own opinion. And if there's bits that you find interesting, you go and find a book about that. that that's that's the sort of my, sorry, I, I started going on about the, you know, the book as opposed to the war, which is what we're supposed to be talking about. We're here to plug the book because it, it is, I, I, I really like it. Oh, okay, let, let's do it because yeah, why, why not? And um Paul Beaver, if you're listening, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> see, the yeah, one of the great stories is the Royal Navy's um sea, sea fire MIG victory. Um, 802 Naval Air Squadron, um, gets, gets bounced, and the MIG pilot sillily getting into a turning turning paddle with a, a yeah. sea fury. What happened, right? There? <clears throat> Well, funny you should ask me that, man. <laughs> it's like, not like we've already talked because, about this. Yeah, no, 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 as I mentioned, I have the reports in front of me. So I'll read some, some extracts. So there's, um, I've got three extracts here. So uh, HMS Ocean, 9th of August, 1952 at 06.30 hours. Um, sea Furies. So Lieutenant P. Carmichael, RN. And he's written here, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, he didn't write blood, he wrote actually other things, but I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read this bit out. It says, enemy aircraft then pulled round the flight with all the flight having a shot. He disappeared behind. As I looked round, I saw an aircraft crash and burst into flames. So he doesn't say he shot one down. He says that they all did. So that's what he's, uh, that's, so that's Carmichael. So I now have Lieutenant P.S. Davis RN about thing. And he writes quite an interesting little bit here, which I'm going to read a bit more of it, which says, I am convinced that the thing which saved us and confused them was the fact that we maintained a reasonably good four plane integrity and attacked every aircraft that we could get our sights onto. It was impossible to see who destroyed the aircraft as it crashed after being fired by all four members of the flight in quick succession. So that's, uh, so that's um, Davis's take on it. And uh, I've got Ellis here, uh, Sub Lieutenant B.E. Ellis RN. Um, and he says, um, I followed my number three in continuous hard break, um, put rolling out to fire at the enemy when necessary. I saw one leg burning on a hillside. I saw my bullets hit on one aircraft on fuselage and tailplane in a head-on attack. Also scored hits on MiG-15 wings on a quarter attack. So that's what he's written there. So again, all of them say pretty much the same thing, that all of them shot at it and nobody, nobody at least not Carmichael, is claiming a kill there. So. Who knows? Uh, as, uh, you know, I think as we all know, Carmichael was put down as the um, as, as, as the, the credit for the kill was claimed to him. And well, as you and I said, Matt, earlier on, yeah, it's probably because he was leading the section, so it's got to go down to somebody. Well, I, I've said give, give them all a quarter, but there we go. <laughs> but, but the Royal Navy said no, so Carmichael get, gets the kill. But whether it was him or not is anybody's guess, really. Yeah, that, that's the that's the other the other bit I always look at in Korean war books. Yeah. Um, if, for 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 the lister, I would I would recommend looking up um, Paul's. He, he's done a couple videos and a couple articles about it, and he's very much in the uh, in the Shmoo Ellis mm -hmm. Ellis camp. Um, but plus, there's there's a wonderful video of of them reuniting Shmoo with the with the Sea Fury down at uh, oh right yeah Navy Wings, which is which is which is fantastic to see. Yeah. Um, right. So let's yeah. yes go 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 look at that. This this has been fascinating, but I think what's equally fascinating, I've actually got a question here saying, how did it all stop? Technically, it never did. <laughs> Correct, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still going on. <laughs> yes. Um, but what, what I always find is fascinating is the especially the Second World War and then Korea, is that the lessons that have been learned, because we very in in terms of um, major conflicts, you, you go from, from Korea and not that much longer, you have very much the the late second generation of, of fighters 
over Vietnam and mm. you, you've got the missile mafia and it's, it's, you know, we were talking about this a bit earlier before this, this idea of the Korea being the last hurrah of the dogfighter and the beginning of, you know, the debate about the pilot in Hong Kong, and we won't get into that. Um, <laughs> yeah. what, what, what do you think the legacies of Korea were that, that were taken forward into that, into that next conflict? Yeah, interesting. I, actually, I, I'm just going to mention one that wasn't taken forward, um, <clears throat> which, and we, we, I guess we we ran out of time to really talk through the sort of interdiction campaign that was that, that, that was fought or not fought. Uh, I, I've actually just seen the time and realised we've been chatting. <laughs> I know, I, just, yeah, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> but we don't we don't want to spoil the book. So if you want to learn about the interdiction yeah. campaign, go um, pick up Mike's book. Thanks for that. Yes, no, I think what we'll do is order another beer and carry on talking another hour. Actually, but there we go. No, uh, which um, w and you look at the very 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 briefly um, attempted to um, interdict um, the uh, Korean supply lines almost impossible to do because um, the Chinese and North Koreans are so ingenious that whenever something gets knocked down, they just replace it or build another one. And they do it sort of almost overnight. So, you know, the great effort would go down to take a bridge down. And then the next day people would pitch up and they go, well, the bridge is still there. Or, oh, there's another bridge now. And that lesson was never, I don't think, was really ever brought into Vietnam, particularly the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a very similar sort of um, thing where, you know, well, how do you stop these people from who, Basically, it's blokes with, um, you know, carrying packs or whatever, or, 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 you know, or, or a train that will go a certain distance and then stop and then it's on something else, transloading things and all that, you know, and then camouflaging things overnight. So, so, so there's that side of it, of, of how you actually interdict a, a sort of guerrilla warfare type campaign in, in that sort of environment, geographic. So that wasn't, but yes, going back to actually the question that you actually asked, as opposed to the one that I just answered. Um, the, no, no, that was probably a better question. I might go back and re-edit that. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The, you're right. The, the last round of the dogfight, and then of course the uh, um, Vietnam happened, and suddenly um, the well, the, the U.S. Air Force was caught with, with its knickers down. Really, that we you know, you, you're suddenly into close in fights with missiles that don't really work. Um, and again, I think missile technology had um, had was not as advanced as people thought it was. I'm going to jump forward. You mentioned drones and things. You know, once again, I think we'll find that things aren't as advanced as people think they are. But anyway, Boots Bless, uh, I mentioned earlier, had, had written that no guts, no glory, you know, how, how to be a fighter, uh, how, how to do their combat. And uh, this had largely, I think, been for, forgotten. And um, we were into now, you know, sort of flo floating around that um, you know, pooping off radar missiles at people. Well, no, that didn't really work. And so, yes, you do you do need to be able to, to, to dogfight, to, to manoeuvre. That was the you know the, the, the re bringing the phantom with a gun you know back into into play, and then you know onto onto things like the F fifteen and F sixteen and, and and airplanes which actually did have the capability. I mean the F fifteen, I, you know, to my mind, it's sort of almost the ultimate war machine really. That massively um, maneuverable at the same time, um, you know, very you know could could carry. All sorts of kit and um, missiles and bombs and god knows what else you know two engines and can go miles so all those things um you know make it a, an airplane that that really did probably learn the lessons of, of, of korea that you've, you've you know we, we talked earlier on about how how airplanes the f-80s had to be replaced by mustangs because they couldn't didn't, didn't go far enough um and again i think that's one of the other things is, is, is that um as, as jet airplanes came in they didn't go as far and they didn't i didn't carry as much and also they needed uh, long runways. So how do you get around these things? Well, air to air refueling is, is probably the big thing that, that, that um, the Americans did actually, and I, I didn't mention it in the book because it, it sort of got too difficult really, but, but they did actually start you know, some of the missions, F-80 missions or F-84 no, F thing, were actually refueled uh, on their way to, uh, you know, from Japan over to Korea as an experiment, see if it worked. And, th and that's the thing. So you, you can end up with a nice long runway somewhere and you can operate these um, airplanes, um, you know, you can get airborne and then you can fill them up with fuel uh, and off they go. Um, and uh, to extent the, the US Navy, again, found in Korea how you, you know, it almost fought the same war over, over Vietnam. So off the west, you know, the east coast again, you know, sit there with three aircraft carriers and, and do your stuff. And again, the sort of lesson to be taken away is, is how you integrate naval um, you know, air power with, you know, with um, you know, traditional sort of ground-based air power. The, you know, the difference between close air support, between the way the USF does it, the way the, the Marines and the, the Navy do it. So there are all those kind of aspects of, uh, of career as well, which, uh, which, which all come in. But also, I think probably a big one, which, again, I, um, I mentioned earlier on about the Chinese not being terribly experienced when they, they cycle, because they cycle people through, basically. So, they, <clears throat> so again, two, two things that come out of that is the Americans decided that they would have a, a, a some 
fighting in, in Korea. But when guys had done 100 missions, then they'd be sent home and be replaced by somebody else. So what happens is that you then end up with this series of people cycling through the unit and they arrive and there's people who are coming to the end of their time. So, the, so your newbies learn from the old guys and then and experience gets passed down. So that was the, that worked really well. What the Russians did was to, and, and the, um, the Chinese did, was to actually put a regiment into the front line. And then after they'd done you know, six months or whatever it was, they then take them out and put another regiment in. So that meant that every six months or whatever it was, you end up with people having to learn from scratch you know how it all works and so the difference in terms of um you know the, the collective memory and, the, and and collective knowledge uh, between the two sides was, was sort of astronomically different um now having said that one of the lessons learned by the germans in world war one and then we learned by everybody since and um the american particularly in vietnam which you know again we come back to this whole business about um from career air fighting was that if you last the first you know most people are lost in the first 10 missions so if you last 10 missions you're probably going to last 100 so you have in America, you have re exercise red flag, where you know you you, you fly your um, you, your first ten missions there instead of in real war. And what the Chinese did um, was to to cycle all their guys through Korea, ten ten sorties. Well, you might not see anybody, but at least you've been there. So what they did in you know again their air force, which started from nothing in 1949, and suddenly in 1953, is massive, and all the guys in it have flown. 10 plus combat missions over Korea. So you've actually, although you've diluted, you know, you, 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 you don't have experts, everybody has a bit of an idea. So, you know, what, what a, a different way of looking at things and, and probably a very valid one. But um, so I think those are the, the, those are the lessons there. How do the Navy work? How do you integrate to air power? Um, there's the fighter um, combat side of it, missiles. And then of course there, you know, um, you know as I've said, there's a business about experience of how you rule more people through um, and, and, and how you, how you get people to, to do those first 10 missions so that you've got half a chance of, of lasting a bit longer. This has been absolutely fascinating. We, 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 we're, we, <laughs> we, you can tell I've been locked in my house for, for the last year, can't you? I can't stop talking. <laughs> I find, yeah, I, I find career fascinating. And the, the great thing about the show is I get to pick the stuff that I like, yeah. but you know, the, that sort of indelible image, which, you know, on the cover of your book is with, you know, sab sabres and, in, in crazy yeah. altitudes and things and you know for me i'm a big james holzer fan anyway so i i, I think that the hunters is a very interesting look at a, a unit mm -hmm. under pressure skip the film people it is robert mitchum and mitchum is very good in it but it's not <laughs> it, it's not a shade on the book this idea that we have of korea which is literally mig alley there is so much more to it which is absolutely fascinating and your book spends a lot of time mo moving moving the mud which is is that legacy i think is is fascinating from korea to, to vietnam is they they were not fighting the enemy that they thought they were and because of that the tactics they were using yeah. were were incorrect no i think that's right actually and i mean i should say as, as an excellent moving part of myself i'm probably biased to these things <laughs> <laughs> not me but there we go but yes what i say is, is to anybody listening to this is, is that the, the you know the korean war is a fantastic you know, really really fascinating so it's so many different facets and angles and all the rest of it and you know yeah do you know read all about it and, and find out because it really is it, it opens your eyes to, to so much and uh, you know as you say uh, avenues down to other books and god knows what else that, that, that are there so you know I, um, it is a, it's a fascinating subject so what's the book called give, give it a plug as we as we wrap this up <laughs> yeah well it's called korean air war uh, it's a sub a subtitle uh, sabers migs and meteors 1959 um i should say that that was the originally i anticipated talking or writing about the, the raf participation but then the, it, it, the thing snowballed but as i'd floated the idea that the um uh, the, the publishers like that mix sabers mix and meteors title but but the reason and then i, I, I said oh can we change it because there's so much more to it as i've just bored you with for the last couple of hours but uh, <laughs> but that's it it's published by osprey and it actually and although so i say it myself i mean they've done a beautiful job in in, in, in producing the book it's, it's a good looking book but but i hope that also it's, it's an interesting interesting read and hopefully we'll, we'll open up you know as i say a really fascinating subject to to, to, to people as well yeah, and and just to say, you you wrote a fantastic article for the aviation historian about the the RF. That's, yeah, that's change, yeah, which, yeah. That, that, again, I, I probably could have written as as, you, as you've discovered, I babble on. I could have written more about that as well. But there we go. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mike. Like I said, the book is out now. We shall put it on our bookshop as well, so if people want to grab yeah. that, they can they they can do so. It is it is stunning. I, when it arrived, the poor old postman gave me a dirty look because it is a heavy book. <laughs> it's quite heavy, isn't it? 
the pictures in here are just absolutely funny. So if 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 buy it from Mike's tech, which is beautifully written, but also you know, grab grab yourself a, a glass of something and look at some of the, the pictures because I I I really do like the the, the panther. I think it's a, a strange but beautiful looking. It is actually, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. You got some yeah. lovely pictures, yeah. including as I've just put it down. There's 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 one on the back page. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. Indeed, yes. Mike, thank you so much for joining. It's <laughs> a pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Many thanks to Michael Napier for joining us here on History Hack. His book is Korean Air War. It is published by Osprey and it is out now. And of course, you can buy it at our very own bookshop. Head to bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack and you'll be able to find Mike's book and all the books from our recent guests as well. Not only do you support them, but 10% of every sale goes to supporting the podcast. And we thank you for all your support. And of course, now we've got the Patreon bit. In 2020, when the boss ladies Alex and Alina started History Hack, the world was very strange. And unfortunately, it looks like 2021 is going to be equally strange. We would love it if you're able to support the podcast in any way. It will allow us to keep up the regularity of the pods and also the great guests that we've been able to bring you over the last year. We exist on Patreon as History Hack and also on Podbean, our podcast host's own platform called Patreon. The reward tiers are being updated at the moment, so there's going to be some fantastic options for you to choose from. So if you're able to support us, that would be fantastic. So we thank you very much, and until the next time.